The depth of this Memphis Grizzlies roster is insane. Tyus Jones is the best backup point guard in the association. Brandon Clark's realized exactly what he does best offensively over the last two years. Dylan Brooks continues to be one of the game's toughest shot makers and peskiest defenders. And rookie sensation David Roddy has now posted back-to-back -back games of scoring in double figures. Meanwhile, year four Ja Morant is more slithery and explosive than ever before. Plus he's shooting a career best percentage from three-point range. Jaron Jackson Jr. missed the first 14 games of the year, but with Triple J's versatility, awareness, and well-timed rim protection back for this past month, Memphis is relentless as of this recording. Despite those who claim Ja doesn't make his teammates better or contribute to winning basketball, he just dropped his third triple-double of the season, his second of the week. All without one of their best players in Desmond Bain, Memphis has won seven straight over New Orleans, New York, Minnesota, Philly, Detroit twice, OKC, Miami, Atlanta, and now Milwaukee. On Thursday night in the 901, the Grizz may have just made a statement to the NBA while securing first place in the West. The Warriors blew out the Celtics, the Bucks blew out the Warriors, and now the Grizz just beat down on the Bucks, beating one of the best teams in basketball by 41 points. Next to John Morant's ascension into a bona fide superstar, Triple J being one of the best stretch big men and backside defenders has laid the foundation for the Grizz potentially being in the early stages of a dynasty. Basketball fans in Memphis are blessed with both an extremely well-run front office and coaching staff. President Zach Kleiman has avoided any type of complacency that comes with a couple years of playoff success continuing to put as much talent as possible around his top-notch young duo. Coach Taylor Jenkins has had the ear of this team since day one. In game three of last year's West Semis, though, the Warriors were blowing out the Grizzlies and would have certainly gone up 2-1 and debatably have won the series either way, whether Ja Morant's forced to leave game three with 6.09 remaining or not. That said, I know the Grizzlies have shown to be a great team even when Morant doesn't play, posting a 20-5 record last year when Morant sat out, but Jaws' services were obviously still severely missed for the rest of that series against the Dubs. Even without Morant, the Grizzlies made Game 4 competitive, losing by just 3. Then they blew out the Warriors by 39 in Game 5. In Game 6 back in San Francisco, it was a back-and-forth affair all night, but give credit to the Warriors for blowing it open at the end. It goes without saying, the team's number one option means everything to this team's chances when individual shot creation means most when defenses tighten up in the playoffs. So I'm not saying I'd agree, but you could argue that if Ja was healthy, things could have gone differently. But of course, credit to the Dubs for winning their fourth chip in eight years. They won the first edition of this rivalry. But the Warriors and Grizzlies could definitely be a rivalry we see resumed in this year's playoffs. If Memphis is the number one or number two seed and the currently under 500 Warriors sneak in as the number seven or number eight seed, a first round affair between these two Western Conference heavyweights would be absolute fire. Let's not forget, Clay Thompson called out Jaron Jackson Jr. for a tweet in his post-game interview after winning the title. Steph was mocking Ja by doing the gritty when celebrating the chip in the club. You can't forget Dylan Brooks breaking the code against Gary Payton II, or when Morant started dancing when Curry was crossed up by Desmond Bain, or when Steph clamped up Morant at the end of the game, blocked him, and then got hyped in his grill. I don't think we've seen the end of this Golden State-Memphis rivalry quite yet. Around Morant's dribble penetration, shiftiness, and quick twitch shot creation, plus the pick and pop threat and defensive versatility of Jackson Jr., the skill sets of the Memphis supporting cast members fit in very well. Tyus Jones is averaging individual best averages in points and assists per game, career highs manufactured by his quick first step, helping him to effectively attack angles as the pick and roll ball handler. Trent Forrest is going to get back right here and hand check Tyus, but he just stays on balance and softly floats it over him. Proving he would start for about any other team, Tyus has great poise working in the lane as he can break down defenders in semi-transition isos or slip screens and has the patience to locate three-point snipers. In his first two seasons, 14.5% of Brandon Clark's attempts came from three-point range. That equated to 1.1 three-pointers attempted per night, to which he made an underwhelming 30.5% of. In his third and so far his fourth campaign, three-pointers make up less than a percentage point of Brandon's overall attempts. 
This means Clark has come to terms with being a player who operates almost strictly from 0 to 3 and 3 to 10 feet offensively. The near 15% volume of the three-pointers he used to attempt now account for Clark's shots from 10 to 16. In other words, the looks he's getting after picking and popping now come from the mid-range, whereas he used to attempt and mostly brick threes. You gotta respect the adjustment for Clark. In a modern-day NBA that demands every player to shoot threes, He's being innovative. To wrap up this video, I could go in detail on how the Grizzlies have 9 players making at the very least one three-pointer per game in the currently injured Desmond, along with Jiddy, Tyus, Jake LaRavia, Triple J, 12, Santi Aldama, The Villain, and Daniel Roddy. A few of those players are severely undermentioned in the NBA universe, but to open up those looks, Another sparely talked about guy is the Kiwi Steven Adams, who leads the NBA in offensive rebounds per game. A ton of three-point shots come when defenses give up the O boards because they're scrambling. Good news for Memphis fans is that Steven's also an above-average passer for a center, ranking number 12 at his position in assists per game. However, the best part about this Memphis team is their post-game celebrations. The consistent energy from the Grizzlies just goes to show that all of these guys genuinely enjoy competing for each other. Salty opposing fans who lose by 20 plus are of course going to hate it, and Memphis still has a lot to prove, but all the pieces are in place for this team to win the 2023 title. Reliability is the name of the game, and the Grizzlies simply have that. To win it all, you need three legit individual creators. Memphis has Bain, Morant, and Jackson. You need really good 4th and 5th scorers as well. Memphis has that with Dylan Brooks and Tyus Jones. You need 3-point specialists. Memphis has that with John Conchar and the just-returned Zaire Williams. You need wing defense and size up front. And Memphis has that with Brooks and Jackson again to go along with Brandon Clark, Steven Adams, Santi Aldama, David Roddy, even a guy currently in the G League who could be valuable down the line in Kenny Lofton. Who deserves more love on the Grizzlies? Two shoutouts from my last upload and this one next time. Get your takes in because there's only six days left until the Speaks board resets and I give out my merchandise. Thanks for watching. Have a good one.